my fellow Dream Chasers and Disney fans across the world, and welcome to the latest episode of Kingdom of Isolation, where in times of trouble, why not isolate yourself with the magic of uh, Disney? It's just myself on there on camera today, because... Uh, um uh, slight uh, snafu on my end behind the scenes, but uh, we'll not worry about that too much. Um, but nevertheless, uh, in times of trouble, why not isolate yourself with the magic of Disney, as we always do? Uh, we're recording this on April Fool's uh, on April Fool's Day. No, that is not an April Fool's. Uh, <laughs> But uh, today we are talking about 101 Dalmatians, released in 1961. But of course it wouldn't be the Kingdom of Isolation without me having a guest on uh, board. Uh, she's been with me twice before. We've done Pinocchio and Cinderella together. This is the first episode proper of the second year of this show's run. It's my fellow Arianator, and we're both very excited about some certain <laughs> Ariana Grande news that got released earlier this week. Ellie's back! Ellie! Hello! Yeah. Hi! Yeah, so yeah, like I said, uh, we, I think we are both very excited Arianators <laughs> because of the news that we just found out earlier this week. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. She's on, is that, she's on The Voice. Yes, she is now officially one of the coaches on The Voice over <laughs> stateside on NBC. Guys, if anybody's got a VPN, I want, I want a <laughs> VPN because I want to start watching the show. <laughs> oh, boy. I say, tw I say they're on, like, what, 21 seasons now, I think? Oh, God, that's worse. Yeah. I say, I say they, must, they must do, like, at least... They must have done, like, at least two possibly per year even with the current restrictions in place but uh yeah. but nevertheless um i like that we're recording this on april 1st um tomorrow april 2nd is when the stay at home order in scotland is uh, is being increased to just staying in like your local council area so still can't really travel anywhere outside of my council area in my case but uh hopefully not too much longer before i can actually start traveling to see people again yeah. Which, which reminds me, Ellie, we definitely need to catch up pronto. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, so, uh, 101 Dalmatians. Uh, where to begin with this one? And just for the record, folks, uh, I did finish watching I did finish watching it uh, for the purpose of this episode within the last hour. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so 101 Dalmatians. Where do we begin with this uh, with this little gem? <sighs> All right, so uh, right, so right, we're still there. Right, so it's fine. Um, so yeah, uh, there, there's a there's a lot to go through. Um, is that uh, I say, uh, Ellie won't be able to see, Ellie won't be able to see what's happening as far as my uh, my screen is concerned until. This episode goes live, which hopefully should be in the next couple of days, depending on how quickly I can get it all put together. Um, so yeah, let's say it's it's based on the it's it's based on a book of based on the book of the same name, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's got an it's got an iconic villain, it's got an iconic villain, an iconic song to go with it, and uh, the legacy the film's left behind as well. Uh, so we'll get into we'll get into all of that. Uh, as we uh, as we go on through the uh, th through the episode, and uh, of course, as always, spoiler alert in place if you guys haven't <laughs> seen the film yet. It's it's par for the course. Got to have that spoiler alert in if anybody hasn't <laughs> seen the film yet. Uh, I am getting through these slowly but surely, folks, and I am hoping by the end of the year, hoping fingers crossed, touch wood. That I can get to the end of the animated Disney run with Rhea and the Last Dragon, which is available on Premier Access right now, but it will be free for all Disney Plus subscribers in June, which is just a couple of months away. So let's head to, let's head to 1960s London as we go through 101 Dalmatians. So opening credits. It's a bit of bit of a departure from what we've seen uh, previously, but I will say this: the opening credits are definitely some of the most creative that I've seen from the films that we've covered so far. Every, I think just um, uh, it's just everything from uh, everything from like the, the the jazzy music, and then just uh, the just some of the some of the animation. Uh, going on over the uh, opening credits as well. It's it's definitely up there as one of the most creative um, uh, opening credits that I've um, seen from the Disney films we've covered so far. A 
I meant to ask, did you, I, I meant to ask, you did make sure you took notes for the film as well, right? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's just, you've been, it's just, um, it's just, it just doesn't sound, it just doesn't sound like you've had much to, um, uh, put in at the moment, um, uh, which is, um, but I say, but I say, don't, 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 don't worry, Ellie's still here. It's just, um, I'm just trying I'll to. I'll be adding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm listening for this for the moment. <laughs> ah, right. Okay. So yeah. Uh, so like I say, it's a very, very creative uh, opening credits, and and even even some of the music over the uh, the opening credits are uh, definitely, um, uh, they're definitely hinting at, um, definitely hinting at Cruella uh, later on in the film, and then. And then, and then some of the other bits of the uh, the music score used uh, in the opening credits are featured uh, throughout the film as well. It's not the first time that has happened. Um, but then once the opening credits are out of the way, uh, we get introduced to uh, the first batch of um, uh, characters proper. Uh, we have got uh, mm-hmm. Rod Taylor voicing... Uh, Pongo, who is uh, the, who's the Dalmatian pet of uh, Roger, who's voiced by Ben Wright. Uh, Roger is a songwriter in uh, in this film, uh, which is a bit of a departure from the book, where it's um, where um, where Roger in the book is actually uh, a, a financial wizard, being able to wipe out. Uh, the whole uh, wipe out the debt for the um, uh, for the whole of uh, the UK. If only we had somebody like that in this day and age. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, um, let's say, uh, so what, one of the things um, uh, it's, uh, for the first for the for the first uh, opening part of the film, it's uh, it's all narrated from uh, Pongo's uh, point of view, and. And there, and one line in particular, he says, uh, saying, uh, "My old pet needed someone," uh, as as if Pongo is, as if Pongo is Roger and Roger is uh, Pongo. If that makes sense, folks. Um, seeing his old, saying his old pet needed someone, and uh, yeah, judging by the mess of the flat, it pr- that pretty much, um, yeah, I definitely need someone. <laughs> uh, but then, while Pongo is. But then, while Pongo is looking uh, for somebody to um, uh, match up with um, Roger and potentially himself, for that matter, um, so there, there is one particular uh, candidate. I say that in air quotes. Uh, uh, where you have um, a, a poodle and their owner. Uh, I think the the animation for the um, uh, the poodle like hair on uh, both. Uh, the poodle itself and her owner, uh, def- it definitely grabs your attention. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And then, of course, uh, and then, of course, it, it always seem it always seems to be the last one when it comes to these sort of things. It's always the last candidate that hits the jack. It's always the last candidate that uh, meets all the requirements. It's always the last one. Why can't they go for the first one for a change? <laughs> oh dear! But um, but yeah, uh, this is when we see uh, Perdita and Anita for the first time. Uh, Perdita voiced by uh, Kate Bauer, and Anita is voiced by Lisa Davis. Um, and then, uh, then Pongo takes it upon himself to uh, change the clock. Which actually got me thinking, given what we've just had over the course of uh, the past week, did Roger forget to put his clock and watch forward an hour? Oh, yeah, perhaps. Because uh, it, it's, it's, it's in a contemporary setting, contemporary London. Yeah. Uh, and I did, I did do my research on the uh, British uh, summertime. Uh, and it was in, it was firmly in place by the time the, the book and the... Um, uh, actually, I'll double. I say, just need to double check something regarding the book. When was the book published? The film was released in 1961. 1956. Yep, easily, easily. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Um, so British summertime firmly established by the time the book was out and the film was released. So yeah, I'm putting that down to Roger. Uh, 
uh, forgetting to put his clock and watch forward. <laughs> now, I mean... I mean, a, a lot of people could say, Oh, that's just for plot convenience. Now he's just like, Oh, let's change the clock because we can. If you put the logic <laughs> behind it, it makes sense. The, the logic <laughs> point here is the fact that Roger may have forgotten to put his clock forward. I mean, for all we know, it could very well have been the Sunday the clocks went forward. Oh, yeah. I always forget all the time, so I wouldn't blame him if he forgot as well. Yeah, uh, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say I say, with how much technology we're consumed by these days, uh, it's all yeah. it's, it's all it's all done there digitally now these days. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, ap- ap- apart from the car clocks, and you're just like, oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's about, I mean, I mean, some of the surely, surely the car clocks need to be programmed where they can, uh, where they, I was like, well, the, the current cars now, but but some some of the some of the older cars, you're just like, oh, great, we're gonna do this yeah and then we gotta do that yeah but uh but yeah um i'll say, I'll say once roger adjusts his uh, watch to the time on um on the clock um i say uh the music that we heard towards the end of the um uh the opening credits it's it's sped up slightly um but it but it is really cheerful at the same time uh where you've got roger and pongo heading to the park to see well in, in Pongo's case, to see uh, Padita to try and get uh, Roger to match with uh, uh, Anita. Oh, boy. <laughs> but um, th- that part all climaxes with um, uh, with Pongo taking Roger's hat, puts it next to Anita on the bench, and then, and then he's just like looking back and forth, and then and then it's like, oh no, they're going! Ah, what do I do? <laughs> and then t- takes it upon himself to use his leash to wrap round Roger and Anita's legs. And then, and then they're both like apologizing to each other. They're on the verge of falling into the water. Uh, Padita tries to gr- uh, catch um, Anita's uh, jacket, and unfortunately, Roger and Anita both fall in. And then we get a cliche right out the gate on that one. Oh no, my clothes are ruined! It seems to be another cliche. Uh, Disney do like to fall on these very safe uh, cliches. Yeah. Well, well, they're, well they're, they're cliches now, but we wouldn't have known it at the time. Yeah. But, um, but yeah. Um, uh, they, they end up, uh, they end up having a laugh, and then, um, and then, a, a gr- and then uh, a very clever transition at this point, where you've got, um, let's like, see, so uh, so yeah, everything around uh, Pongo is just like uh, it's like dims to like uh, uh, blackish, uh, but then there's it's like a, a circle around him, and then is that that transitions very smoothly into the church where Roger and Anita. Uh, get married, mm. and and after and after after they're married, uh, they're into they're into October now. Uh, uh, Pongo establishes this through his uh, uh, voiceover narration. Um, uh, Roger still work. Roger still working on his um, songwriting, and then uh, the melody he's playing on the piano in in their new house. By the way, folks, uh, with their. Um, with their housekeeper, uh, back to the voice cast tab. I've got I've got this all in front of me, folks. Bear with me, uh, Martha. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, uh, Martha Wentworth uh, is uh, the voice of their uh, nanny, uh, the Radcliffe's uh, cook and housekeeper. Um, and and it, and it actually says here in the voice cast notes detests Cruella, Cruella and. Um, oh boy, very maternal and fussy. Um, that definitely sa- that definitely sounds like she wants everything to be just so, a bit like myself sometimes. <laughs> oh, I've just I've just realised something. I forgot. just realised. Uh, forgot to change the background to uh, this. There we go. That's more like it. <laughs> um. I said uh, I I did this last episode in uh, Sleepy Beauty. I was like, I was like, um, I've been working on ways to f- uh, to further improve how 
I put these uh, episodes together. I mean, it started off with just me on camera, my, um, my living room in the background, um, my guests in voiceover, and then started using Zoom, and then from my Christmas special, Nightmare Before Christmas, um, started incorporating footage from uh, the films, and then and then it was uh, Lady in the Tramp and Sleeping Beauty that I actually properly started implementing the footage of the film. But Sleeping Beauty, oh my word, the trouble I had trying to get that up onto my <laughs> channel. Uh, but I got, but I got there, um, and you can find all the episodes to my uh, the, uh, this uh, series in the top right of your screens. So there we go. Uh, so, so there we go, some concept art for 101 Dalmatians in the background. So that way, uh, in my case, I feel like I'm actually in the film. Uh, but like, but like, but like uh, Ellie won't see this uh, until it's actually, um, until the episode actually goes live on um, on my channel. Like I said, hopefully I should be able to get it up in a, in a couple of days, depending on how much footage I decide to get from the film. But of course, got to make sure, got to make sure I... Um, I gotta make sure I could be I'd be careful with how much I use because you know copyright issues Disney are ridiculously protective with their copyrights and even that's an understatement. But uh, but yeah, uh, the so the um, so the piano foreshadowing Corella's appearance and um, and then a little bit of songwriting one hundred and one, folks uh, from uh, Roger uh, melody first. And then the lyrics, which is why when it comes to me right uh, when it comes to me writing lyrics to uh, hip hop based uh, backing tracks for uh, so, uh, for the raps that I've been uh, writing, yes, I do. Yes, I do write my yes, I do write lyrics to uh, some of my, some of my stuff. Uh, yeah, uh, the uh, melody first, then uh, lyrics. Uh, I always make sure I find the backing track first, and then I use that as my base for uh, whatever I want to write about in. In the song I put together, uh, but yeah, uh, then then you hear the car horn, that devil woman, Padita's words, and then we get introduced to Cruella uh, Deville, voiced by Betty Lou uh, Gerson, um, and it's and the, the car she drives is similar to that of the Mercedes Benz 500K Cabriolet. Um, uh, say th those that aren't really into their cars will be like, uh, Ibn the But yeah. Yes, please <laughs> But yeah, the, um, but yeah, that's when, and that's when we see, then that's when, that's when we hear, uh, Cruella de Vil, the song itself, the main song of the film. It, uh, and, and I think it's, I think it's probably like one of only like, two or three that are, that are done for uh, the film. But while Cruella is uh, it's just like, uh, right, where's the puppies? Where are they? Does she not know how... Does she not know... Uh, should, does she not know how long it takes for uh, puppies to be uh, produced? Uh, but yeah, I say, a little bit impatient. But, um, what's it? A little bit impatient, lives for fur, and so you, you you can just tell she is just really, really unlikable. As iconic a villain she is, she is. It's not very often I not very often I throw this word around when it comes to describing movie characters, or in some cases TV characters. Uh, but irredeemable is probably the best way to describe her. Yeah, probably. Uh, that's what makes her a good. So, go ahead. Sorry, that's what makes her a good villain. That's what makes her so iconic. Yeah, in in the same way, in the same way with uh, Lady Tremaine from uh, uh, Cinderella. Yeah. But yeah, uh, but then you but then you hear some then you hear uh, uh, Roger playing more instruments. Uh, you see, plays a trumpet at one point and then a trombone. Uh, he might have a saxophone in there as well while we're at it, which, uh, um, uh, and, and this is, and this is my, uh, and this is my, uh, uh, required allocation of, um, fun notes that I, uh, that I like to bring up. Is there any instruments Roger can't play? I mean, he, he I mean, he's, he's a songwriter, so he's got to be very, so he must be very diverse in, uh, a majority of, um, 
uh, instrument. I mean, I'll say, I'll say you've got the trumpet, the trombone, and of course, his faithful piano. Yeah, um, they must all work their ways. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> but yeah. Um, uh, but on but on top of that, um, once Cruella has uh, once Cruella has uh, left because uh, she, she's got to wait a, another few weeks before before the pup uh, before the puppies are actually born. Um, literally below the literally below the fun note I just put together. Um, the, the, the climax of uh, Cruel, uh, the Cruella Deville song. Uh, if anything, that song could work for all the Strictly fans out there, or Dancing with the Stars for my friends over stateside. That song <laughs> could work as a tango for Strictly's movie week. Oh, it could. Oh, yeah. I like that idea. Yeah. That's like... I said, I said, I said, I've, I've, I've come up with a load of, I've come up with a fair few ideas for, um, I mean, I mean, look, BBC, if you need me to help with their song choices for, um, um, uh, for Strictly, I'd be more than happy to help because I've, I've, because hey, me being as creative as I am, I've got plenty of ideas. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean. I mean, a couple of examples I've got right out the gate. Uh, here's hoping they, here's hoping they take notice. I mean, uh, using uh, Earth, Wind, using Earth, Wind and Fire's disco classic September for a cha cha cha. That's a good song. Oh my goodness. And yeah, Survivor's Eye of the Tiger. Oh my god. For a Paso Doble. Oh my god. <laughs> yes. That's like, that's it. That's it. It's, it's, if you if you guys listen if you guys listen to the tracks and you watch how a cha 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 and a paso, uh, you watch how those two dancers play it and you listen to those songs, you'll understand why I feel those songs could yeah. work. Yeah, I agree. You watch Strictly as well? No, I've, like I haven't seen it, but like I like you know I know the dances. I've seen it like once or twice. Yeah. Um. But yes, no, I agree with you. There we go, folks. There we go, folks. I've already got somebody on board. <laughs> here's hoping, I'd like to say, here's hoping the BBC take notice. <laughs> but yeah, uh, let's say all that's out of the way, and then, and then we, and then we cut to um, a dark, stormy, a dark, stormy night in, uh, uh, still in October, a few weeks later, uh, raining thunderstorm, and the uh, this. And I will say this, it a great way of building the tension. You just hear the, you just hear, uh, the the thunder and lightning. In in the background, you just hear that, and then you hear the ticking of the clock. And that's I say, and and that that, and that's really, and that's really all that was needed for that scene to help build the tension, as to um, as to how long it was going to be before. Uh, the puppies started um, arriving into the world, and no, yeah, and then and then the puppies are born. Um, the the puppies are born. Nanny's excited, and it um, it's absolutely it's, it's absolutely joyous occasion until it's not because they uh, because. Uh, it, it was initially 15, but then that number gets reduced to 14. And yes, I did my research on this, folks. I was like, can they can they produce as many as 15? And yes, they can. I mean, the average is sort of like between like eight and 10, but but we have but we have seen litters that go up to 15. And um, but then but then it goes down to 14 because because uh, it looks like one of them didn't uh, survive and. The way Roger, tr um, the way Roger tries to warm up, um, uh, number fifteen, is I'll say it's, it's definitely some here in the IMDb trivia somewhere, definitely somewhere. Uh, but, 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 but whereabouts is it? It's it's definitely here somewhere. Uh, yes, come on. Whereabouts is it? There's definitely something in here. Um, right, where 
pronounce, are we? There we go. Ah, right at the top. There we go. Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm, I might as well start incorporating the IMDb trivia into this as well. Let's see. This is actually very interesting to bring up. Uh, uh, the way the way the birth of the puppies happened in the film did actually happen to the author of uh, the book, Doddy Smith. Her, her, her Dalmatians had 15 puppies as well. And one was um, initially stillborn. And and uh, her husband, uh, and Dodie's husband at the time, uh, managed to revive um, that lifeless puppy. I'm assuming in the same way that Roger did in the film. Oh, that's amazing. So, yeah. So, yeah let's see, like I said, I, 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 I might start using some... Uh, uh, the IMDb trivia as well at some point, but uh, but yeah, absolutely. That's it. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, really good. Uh, and, the, <laughs> and then we get that la- Then we get that last thunder strike. Um, well, light lightning strike, lightning first, then thunder. Um, you hear the thunder, but you see the lightning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, uh, the last um, lightning strike is emphasized above all the others because Cruella comes in uh, and effectively crashes the party. Um, (laughs) And she's like, right, how much for all of them? And and Anita's Anita's just like, calm as you like. She's like, no, we're not selling them. But (laughs) Roger and Pongo's faces at this point. (laughs) They are just absolutely priceless even even when they're even when they're covered in the ink to make the dalmatian spots they still have that they still have that you are not taking those puppies away from us and nothing is going to change our mind on this it's just (laughs) it's just absolutely priceless and and roger still has that expression on his face and he's still able to keep standing even with Cruella shouting in his face and you're just gonna like how how does he look so uh, angry but stay so calm at the same time minus the stuttering but that aside love- how, how does he manage that <laughs> I'd love to know yeah. But, yeah um and then, and then we transition to where the puppies uh, growing uh, growing up a little bit more. Um, they've got they've got their collars on, and let's see if we can find the cast for the puppies. If I can find them, let's see. Whereabouts are they? Uh, bu- 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 bu. Oh, so, oh, so they've this this. Got to be. So there's got to be. A, there's got to be a voice cast for the um. Uh, for the puppy somewhere. Ah, here we go. We've got. Um. So it looks like. So it looks like we've got. So, so we do have a. We do have a couple of names here. We've got uh, Mimi Gibson who voices uh, Lucky and is. Um, Let's just say he likes to be glued to the, to the TV, and and when I say glued to the TV, I'm like just like just like right up to the screen, folks. <laughs> but um, and we also got Rolly, who is always hungry, uh, voiced by Barbara, uh, Barbara Beard or Baird or however. You- however you pronounce that. Uh, and then you've got Patch, voiced by uh, Mickey Maga. And, and there's, al- there's also another puppy uh, called... Uh, uh, let's see. So we've also got Penny, uh, voiced by Sandra Abbott. Uh, the only puppy of the 15 not to be named for her appearance or habits interestingly so it's very clever how they managed to name the um name all their um 
Name all their puppies. I'll see, I'll see if I can find... I'll see if I can find the rest. Whereabouts are they? It's gotta be in here somewhere. Yeah, he's uh, da 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 I'm still born. Ba -ba 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 uh, right. Uh, I think I think I might need to I think I might need to delve deeper into. I think I might need to delve deeper into the um the characters list for um for that to um. Uh, so I'll, I'll I'll get I'll get the names up on I'll get the names up on screen of all the uh, of, of all the puppies, but um because I can't really I can't really pinpoint them at the moment. But like I said, I will have the names up on screen at some point. So, um, getting the puppies to bed uh, while they're watching uh, fun while they're watching old Thunderbolt. Um, and it was um, and, and and was lucky like glued to the TV with uh, Thunderbolt faking the fact that he was shot. Just boom. Cuts to the bad guys like, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> to to say it scared Lucky away from the TV would be a bit of an understatement. And uh, <laughs> and yeah, uh, Thunderbolt wins in that episode, and then we get a commercial for K Nine Crunchies, spelled with a K, interestingly, instead of a C. Now, no idea why they could have done that, but um, oh, hey ho, I'm not the one in charge of the advertising. But, uh, I mean, very clear. of course I couldn't be in charge of the advertising. The film was released in 61. I was born in 93. <laughs> but, but, yeah, um, I'll say, uh, I'll say the Radcliffe's take Pongo and, uh, Pongo and Pedita out on a walk. And then we get in, and then, uh, another, another couple of characters we get introduced to at this point. Oh, boy. Could you get henchmen that were any more useless than these guys <laughs> honestly could they be any more useless you got uh, you got j pat o'malley and frederick uh, frederick warlock uh, that's the warlock that's warlock w o r instead of warlock as, uh, as in w a r they um the oh turns out they're both brothers Oh, I, did, I did not know this until tonight. <laughs> um, I say, I say they're the um, they're the badons. Um, that's B A double D U N. I say, I say I didn't even know they were brothers until I just <laughs> until I spotted the surnames. Uh, I say they voiced Jasper and Horace, and like I say, goodness me, could they be any more useless? Uh, uh, and and of, and of course, the way they're introduced, pretty stereotypical for uh, villain slash sidekicks. Like dark vehicle, dark clothing, dark lighting, bit cliche, but don't fix what ain't broken, right? Uh, they see, um, uh, they see the Radcliffe's and the dogs head off to the park, and that gives them the cue to head into their house. To steal the puppies, and they they try to play themselves off as part of uh, an electric company. And goodness me, the way it's written on the bag, goodness me. I mean, I mean that. I mean that was all. That should have already been a sign that, uh, yeah, nope, you ain't getting in. But, mm. but of course, um, but of course, uh, what's that? I, was like, I, I honestly couldn't tell the difference between the two. I think Jasper's the tall one. So Jasper's the tall one. Horace is the short one, right? There we go. We've established that. So that way I don't confuse them. But mind you, now that I've said that, I'm going to end up confusing them at some point later in this episode. Uh, and I'm going to and I'm going to draw myself back to this particular clip to say, hmm, that aged well. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't come to that, but you never know. Uh, but yeah. Um, Jasper is just, Jasper is just like, uh, yada, 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 and then just, excuse me, and just, boom, storms his way in, and they just squash Nanny behind the door, in the same way Corella did when she came on screen earlier. And you just gotta think, goodness me. <laughs> but, but, um, they managed to, they, might, they managed to play some uh, mind games with her, if you will. 
Uh, they managed to play mind games with Nanny. Um, Jasper manages to keep Nanny in the attic somewhat. And manage, and that allows Horace to take all 15 puppies. While they were still sleeping, might I add. Uh, and just uh, takes... And they take them in their... Um, their vehicle. Because they're trying to pinpoint... Trying to pinpoint what vehicle it is they use. Uh, might be a van. I don't know. Um, but hey, I'm, I'm just going to use vehicle just to make it easier for myself. Uh, and then... And then... And then one of the things that... The first thing that Annie's concerned about is just like... Oh my word. If they've taken the good silver... The good silver, of course, being uh, the... Um, the cutlery. Uh, but uh, no, they've gone... No, what they've done is they've gone and they've only gone and stolen the puppies! <laughs> and and then he's just like ah, no but uh yeah that just happened and she's just like um she's shouting for the police trying to get somebody to ask uh, ask for help and uh yeah uh you've got then you see a couple of um and then you see a couple of the uh uh, newspaper front pages. Uh, one of them, I would assume, being the Daily Mail, because that is the newspaper that Jasper is uh, reading when we're introduced to him uh, a few minutes beforehand. And then you see the green smoke, which of course means we are with Cruella again. And uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, she does look hideous. I, I said I wasn't going to sugarcoat it. I, I said I wasn't going to sugarcoat it, folks. But, uh, but of course, but of course, be, being your stereotypical villain, you do, you are, there, there is something that's like uh, an unwritten rule in villain contracts that they must look somewhat hideous in some capacity. But, uh, but yeah, uh, get a call from Jasper and Horace. And then, oh boy, the, the way she talks down to them, you just got to think, uh, yeah, she does not like working with them at all. But uh, that aside, um, <laughs> she acts, she thinks Jasper saying, shut up, you idiot, to Horace was aimed at her. And she's... <laughs> I mean, I'd be, I'd be just, I'd be exactly like Cruella was if that was, yeah. in, if, if I was, if I was on that call, I was, I'd be like, wait, what? What'd you call me? And, and, and they're just like, wait, oh, no, 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 that wasn't, no, 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 that wasn't aimed at you. And then she's just like, <laughs> you imbeciles. <laughs> but, uh, but then, but then she gets a brainwave and ends up calling Roger and Anita, trying to play all nice, you know, so it's, oh no, such terrible news that you've lost, such terrible news that you, uh, the puppies have been stolen. But, uh, oh boy. Roger is just, yeah, he's just like, yeah, she's top of the list. This guy sus. But, uh, hmm. it, yeah, I mean, in a way, yes. But in the grand scheme of things, it is, of course, Jasper and Horace that are top of that list because they're the ones that did the deed to begin with. Oh, boy. Tried every they've tried everything, and then it gets to the point where they decide, uh, you know what, let's try... You know what, let's try the Twilight Bark. Which got me... Which, uh, another little fun note I put in here. Uh, the Twilight Bark, possibly... Is it possibly Dog Morse Code? Oh, that's a good way of describing it. Yeah. That's it, that's it. That's what I mean. I mean, I mean obviously, obviously we don't understand what they're saying until they actually uh, start speaking. But even at that, um, it's a cl clever way of um, being able to... Get the news to travel across uh, the whole of London, and then, and then we get introduced to some more characters. Just need to try and uh, 
Just need to try and find them first. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's see. Where about are we? Uh, characters, voice cast. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Let's see. Uh, yeah, we've got, we've got so we've got we've got them here. Um, we've got uh, we've got old Towser, uh, who's a bloodhound, who helps to get the news uh, elsewhere. Uh, voiced by Tudor Owen. We've got Danny. We've got Danny, who's uh, a Great Dane. Uh, we've also got uh, we've got a we've got we've got a terrier uh, called uh, Scotty. I mean, another terrier, another stereotypically Scottish name. I mean, it was a Scottish <coughs> terrier after all. Uh, Junius Matthews, and we get, and then we've got three more characters we're introduced to towards the end of the Twilight Bark. You've got. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've got uh, you've got an old sheepdog colonel who's also voiced by yeah uh, Pat O'Malley. I mean, I mean this 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 seems to be a recurring thing. Um, seems to be a recurring thing. You've, so you've got them. Um, you've got you've got multiple actors taking on uh, multiple uh, multiple roles. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's it's not the first time that we've seen that, and uh, and I. Guarantee it probably won't be the last, especially especially in this particular era of uh, Disney films. Um, so you've got all towns. Uh, uh, yep, uh, we've got um, we've got a horse called Captain, uh, voiced by uh, Thurl Ravenscroft, and then we've got uh, David Frankham as Sergeant Tibbs, who's a uh, tabby cat. Tabby cat. That's um, I say, I say they, uh, old Towser manages to um, re relay back and forth information to um, uh, to to the colonel, and they manage to decipher where the Dalmatians uh, are, and oh boy, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> um. Uh, it is pretty sure. Pretty sure they've got the name of it somewhere. The nearby old, uh, the nearby old Deville place, uh, Hell Hall, I believe it's called. I might might be wrong on that one. I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. But anyway, um, I'll I'll just use Hell Hall, Hell Hall. If I'm wrong, let me know in the comments, folks. Uh, but yeah, uh, the old Deville place. Yeah, that's um. And then you've got uh, Sergeant Tibbs heads there with the help of uh, the Colonel getting to the destination. Uh, he, then you've, you've got uh, Jasper and Horace with another 84 puppies there making 99. Then you add the two, then you add their Pongo and Padita to that mix. 99 plus 2 and there you go, you've got your 101. Roll credits folks, we're done for tonight. <laughs> oh, it was inevitable that was going to happen at some point, folks. Uh, but yeah, but but of course we're still we're, we're still not done. We're, we're only about like halfway through the film, if that. Uh, Jasper and Horace keeping an eye on the puppies uh, while watching uh, while watching a very interesting game show called What's My Crime. And the premise of the show is a case that they, it's, they ha you've got, you've got these criminals that come onto the show and they, and you've got, you've got a, a panel of three, you've got a panel of three, uh, they need to guess the bizarre crime that uh, the uh, criminal uh, committed in, in uh, less than uh, 10 questions. Now, that is, if anything, a very interesting concept for a game show. I mean, I mean, it could have worked back then, but it's definitely something that wouldn't work now. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. yeah, especially in this day and age. But uh, interestingly, uh, there was also a cartoon that the uh, the, the puppies were watching, and uh, the puppies were watching before. Uh, what's my crime? Um, 
yeah, it, yeah, it is hellhole. It is, it is, it is actually here in the uh, IMDb trivia, folks. Um, uh, in hellhole, um, it's it's a short called uh, it's a short called springtime, which is one of the many Disney silly symphonies that they did uh, back then. But of course, it's not something that would have been. It's not something that would be shown now, mainly because. If if you if you if you manage to if you actually pay attention to like the detail on the faces of the flowers in that particular shot, uh, another way another I say this is another case of yeah can't sugarcoat it. It's blackface. It's something that has not aged well, and it's definitely something that isn't going to be happening uh, even now. But um, but of course that of course sign of the times. But uh, but it, 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 but but I just I just figured it'd be figured it'd be useful to to bring that up. So yeah, there is so yeah, there's that. And uh, oh, there we go. We've actually ah, uh, there we go. We've actually got. And lo and behold, uh, that springtime that springtime trivia bit, just above it, gives us uh, the names of twelve of the uh, fifteen uh, puppies. Uh, Lucky, Rolly, Patch, Penny, Pepper, Freckles, and then established, and then established in other incarnations, you've got Wizard, Dipstick, Two Tone, Cad Pig, Fidget, and Jewel. Now, the first six, okay, but the other six, pretty bizarre choices. Yeah, they're both very different. They're all very different from each other. Yeah, but uh. But I mean, I mean, they had to come up with. I mean, that was the case. Uh, uh, right, we got right, guys. We got to come up with some. We got to come up some, with some names for these guys. Uh, how, how about this list? Checks the list. Perfect. We'll use these. I can only assume that. I can only assume that was their thought process. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, um, what what my crime is finished, and then. And that, while all that's happening, Tibbs is trying to get all the puppies out through, uh, effectively an escape hole. And, oh boy, uh, it's, it is shenanigans, to say the least. Uh, but, uh, Tibbs does manage to get, Tibbs does manage to get all the puppies out. Um, uh, and, oh goodness, they just, the way... The way Jasper and Horace just just go into each other, and then um, you can you can actually see the place literally falling apart. <laughs> oh dear! But uh, then it's a case of they have to report to Cruella. Just like oh, uh, oh uh, yeah, uh, bad news, Cruella. Uh, I think they I think we uh, ended up losing all the puppies. <laughs> If 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 my Cockney accent is bad, folks, please let me know in the comments. I am trying my best here. <laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> uh, joys of being a former acting student. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so um, so let's see there. Ba -ba -ba there ba -ba -ba -ba. Wait, Dean. Um, and while and while all that. Uh, chicanery is happening. Uh, Pongo and P Pongo and Purdy, uh, Purdy short for Petita, folks. Uh, they get, um, they get themselves. Uh, they they leave the Radcliffe house and then they try and go to get uh, the puppies back. Um, and I'm I'm pr I'm pretty sure this is something I put into my notes. Pretty sure something. Um. Um, something is, uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, wouldn't Roger and Anita be concerned that uh, Pongo and Purdy aren't at home? Yeah, that's a plot hole. Mm, yeah, and a uh, couple of other notes. A couple of other notes I forgot to um, a couple of other notes I forgot to bring up here. Um, uh, you've got like. You got like military esque music for the um, for Captain Sergeant Tibbs and uh, the Colonel, 
So you've got like military esque mm. music for that. And you've also got some Lady in the Tramp cameos as well. I was like, because as soon as I saw a Scottish Terrier that looks like Jock from Lady in the Tramp, I was, I was just like, wait, hang on a second, is that Jock from Lady in the Tramp? And then you've got Peg and one of her fellow uh, dog pound friends there as well. I love that. Yeah. Uh, is that this? Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> No, no, so that's just such a Disney thing. Like they like like bringing the all sorts of movies together and sort of like you know just bringing different characters into all their movies. Just like I don't don't know if I'm describing it well, but yeah, uh, I just love that Disney do that. You know. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I get where you're coming from. I say they do, they do, they do have a tendency of. Um, they do have a tendency of uh, throwing in these uh, li- these uh, little Easter eggs. Um, exactly. Uh, here and there, and of course, uh, a recurring uh, Easter egg is it wouldn't. Oh no, that's not it. There we go. That's what we did. Uh... But of course, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be uh, a Disney film without uh, having the hidden Mickey in there. Uh, I say, Disney have a recurring thing of having a, a hidden Mickey Mouse. Yeah. Uh, a, a hidden Mickey Mouse throughout uh, their films, and the hidden Mickey Mouse folks. Um, I, say, I might. I say I'm going to need to try and find the screenshots of this uh, in the opening credits and on almost all the Dalmatians. Now, on the Dalmatians especially, that's a case of yeah, it's right in front of your face the whole time, and you're just like, oh my word, how did I not see that? <laughs> But uh, but yeah, I say um, uh, that's out of the way. Um, Pongo and Purdy trying to get to where the um, uh, where the puppies are. They managed to find them. They managed to find the fifteen thereafter. But uh, they end up. Re- but um, a couple a couple of the puppies say, uh, yeah, there's uh, there's more of us now. That there's actually ninety nine of us to be exact. But Oh my word! And Pongo's just like, wait, what? <laughs> and then, and then, and then, just that panning shot. You're just like, yeah, he's not joking. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but this is this is the um, this is the point in the film for me where they um, where the film ends up. Um, uh, it, it go it goes. This is the point in the film where it ends up becoming an um, it becomes somewhat of an adventure to get uh, to get everybody home. Yeah. Um, it's like a couple of like, I'm pretty sure there's one or two other things of um. Uh, yeah, yeah. I said like, like there's one or two other notes, and I was like uh, Jasper and Horace calling the Dalmatians spotted hyenas, and I'm just I'm just like. I get the, I get their bumbling I get their hopeless henchmen but again literally what I've put this is exactly how I've put it in my notes folks spotted hyenas they are dalmatians you idiots <laughs> brilliant and it's and and they and they still refer to them as spotted hyenas um throughout the film and you're just like mm. <laughs> Uh, if, if if only Cruella was there to just knock some sense into them. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, the um, see when we when we get towards like the last like uh, fifteen twenty minutes of the film, uh, you get uh, there's a collie that uh, that comes out of nowhere, but but of course, I say out of nowhere. It, it's of course thanks to the twilight bark, the news spreading. And uh, all the dogs helping the Dalmatians uh, uh, to get home. And one of the things they managed to do is they managed to get uh, a barn, which is just across the road from the position they're in at that point, thanks to the help of a collie, which is voiced by uh, Tom Conway. Um, so Matt... 
uh, let's say, offers Dalmatians the shelter at uh, a dairy farm for the night. And the music at this point, it's... it's like, when, when you actually see them heading inside the barn, it's, it's just the music swelling. It's, it's a great climax to that particular part of... <laughs> of the film just just that just that emotional triumph if you will they've reached yeah. their destination and now they can rest yeah and 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 this is one of the reasons why i love film scores so much they don't i say in some cases like this they don't get the credit they deserve yeah completely I mean, it, it would they like a film is a film is just made by the sort of the backing music, like it adds to the emotion of it all. Ex and you're right, it doesn't credit. Exactly, exactly, because 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 if anything, I, I mean, you just you just you just summed it up right there. In some cases, the music makes the film what it is. I mean, yeah. I mean, a perfect example of that: the climax to the Lion King. The yeah. I mean, we all know what scene we're on about here, folks. It, um, let's see, just the climax of the film, Simba becomes the king of Pride Rock. The music at that point in the film, that's one of those once-in-a-generation moments in cinema that sort of, like, def it personifies storytelling to a T. The visuals, on, the visuals on screen at the time, the music and the story as well it all fits together in that one scene that we have reached the climax and he has reached his goal i mean i'm sitting here 28 in five days time as of recording and i am i'm now at a point where i cannot get through that scene without getting somewhat emotional yeah but of course but of course the lion king is one of those films that was arguably one of the most important in Disney history. And on top of that, the the fact that we've got... What is it? Um, bear with me. I'll get there eventually. Bear with me. Ah, smeg, I've lost my train of thought. It's going to come... It, it'll, it'll come back to me, folks. It'll come back to me. Let's <laughs> um, say... Was it, was it, not not just not just important for Disney, but for a lot of us growing up, because for for a lot of people growing up, this would have been The Lion King would have been one of their favorite films growing up, and, yeah. and Disney were just unstoppable, especially during the Renaissance period. Yeah. And do, and don't worry, folks. I will get there eventually. I'm getting closer day by day. I've still got still got about I've still got. About like somewhere in the region of about fifteen twenty films to cover before we get to the Renaissance films, and with the Renaissance films especially, I'm hoping I can get to that era before the summer, and then when the summer rolls around, I can put as much time as I need to into making those particular episodes of the Kingdom of Isolation the best they can be because of how special this period was for us growing up. And how important it was for Disney at the time. I will get there eventually, folks. It might it just might take a bit of time, but let's say that's the goal. The Renaissance before the summer, and hopefully Raya and the Last Dragon by the end of the year. But back to 101 Dalmatians. Um we get we see the cat we see some of the cat. We see some of the cows that, uh, that are there. Well, the three cows that are there. You've got uh, Queenie Leonard, who voices Princess. Uh, we've, we've got Marjorie Bennett, voicing uh, Duchess. And we also have... Uh, Martha Wentworth also voices uh, Queenie, who's also one of the... Um, uh, one of the cows. So, so there you go. There's your three cows there. They actually allow the Dalmatians... To actually drink the milk from from their udders. That's yeah. Yeah, but uh, but that scene didn't really go down too well at the time. Um, cause yeah. Because 
Because according to IM, because according to the IMDb trivia, uh, the scene where the puppies suckle from some friendly cows attracted a lot of criticism at the time of release, as it was deemed to be inappropriate for a children's film. Mm. Now, in a way, it's a valid concern because if the puppies are going to be suckling uh, milk, wouldn't they get it off their mum? But granted, there is like ninety nine of them, so you can forgive them for that one. <laughs> and then and then once they've rested and had their fill we get to the climax and it's where we see them going through the snow to make to make their way home and and we reach a point uh one of the last characters we're introduced to is a Labrador. Now, I'm pretty sure there's a voice actor for. I'm pretty sure there's somebody for him as well. Um, uh, bear with me. There we go. Ramsey Hill voicing uh, the Labrador Retriever in Dinsford. And. And then Pongo gets the genius idea. Of disguising the um, uh, disguising themselves and the puppies in the soot to make them look like Labradors as well, which is, I mean, Hi. I mean, I mean it, it's a very clever idea, but uh, with what we're about to see, it might it might need uh, other weather conditions. If you will, yeah. to uh, to make it work as much as it does. But despite that, they managed to get on. They managed to get onto the truck despite the icicles melting, and the and the, the way the music's played at this point as well as it just just timing with the the, the water drops and the water drops on them. Um, on the puppies and seeing the icicles melting and then and then the music starts to build at this point and Corella looking in her mirror she sees the truck that has the um uh the uh uh dalmatian disguise labrador disguised dalmatians if that makes sense the dalmatians disguised as labradors um but then big drop of snow falls on one of the puppies and then they end up looking like a Dalmatian again, and and um, and Chris is like Jasper Horace. They're in that truck. Go get them. And this <laughs> is where, and this is where it, and this is where the climax of the film just kicks up another gear, effectively. But um, yeah, there are a couple of things here. Um. So there are a couple of things to bring up here. Um, something I should have brought up earlier as well. Um, there's re there's a couple of recycled shots throughout the climax of this film. There's, there's one particular shot that's used twice, where you've got three of the puppies in like a chest of drawers, and they like they go back into them and the, the drawer closes. That shot's used twice. There's also there's other pieces of recycled animation from other films early on in the film. Um, you got, um, so you got, uh, Pinocchio and Sleeping Beauty. You've got, like, a recycled animation from Pinocchio and Sleeping Beauty. Disney did have, did have a, a tendency to, uh, recycle their animation. But, um, but I, mean, what, but, I mean, what else could you do on a budget of, like, $3 million at the time? Yeah. But, um, but I say the, uh, but I say the, um, so the uh the truck driver he's just <laughs> uh he's he's got a corral like along alongside him just like trying to force him off the road uh and um for those that have seen the film will know exactly what he says at one particular point i'm not going to i'm not going to repeat what he says i'm just going to i'm just going to let the footage speak for itself just just so I can keep, just so I can keep myself safe, folks. Because, because uh, last thing I want is a posse outside with torches and pitchforks. 
Oh no wait, that's oh no wait, that's for Shrek. Crazy woman driver. <laughs> but um, but one of my favourite shots of that client of that whole chase scene though is Cruella's eyes. If that's not my nephew, I don't know what is. <laughs> But then, but then it all climaxes, and Horace, being the bumbling blockhead buffoon he is, manages to somehow rip the steering wheel off the vehicle he and Jasper are in, and they end up colliding with Corella's car. Oh my god. And, and Corella's still, like, lambasting them. You idiots, you imbeciles, you fools. Ugh! But um, then, then we, but then we hit a, but then we hit uh, the final scene, which is uh, at Christmas. They're approaching Christmas time, and uh, the Cruella Deville song that uh, Roger wrote earlier in the film, he uh, that's ended up on the radio, and it's ended up it ended up being very successful. <laughs> so in a way. You could say that Roger did reach his goal of becoming a su- successful songwriter. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but, of, but of course, the real end goal is getting all um, all the dogs home. And they do manage to do that, albeit in somewhat comedic circumstances. Um, Nanny's saying that uh, it's... Sometimes she's still. Sometimes she thinks she can still hear them barking, and then we actually hear them barking. But then she's just like, "Oh no, it's just my imagination." And uh, yeah, that's not the case. Turns out, turns out they are actually there, and um, even Roger confuses them for Labradors. <laughs> but uh, but once. But uh, once Nanny clarifies that it's just the soot, um, they managed to clean the pu- they managed to clean some of the puppies up, and uh, Pongo and Purdy uh, quickly going through the numbers, and then they reach th- and then they reach the hundred and one, and the last song is uh, let's see it says here uh, Roger decides to use the money from his song to buy a big house in the country. Which Pongo is very happy about formation. Form, for, uh, I need. I need to try and word this. I need to try and word this correctly so that I can, so that I can nail it somewhat. Uh, and uh, and and that and that country house will be the formation of the Dalmatian plantation. Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> and and of course that and of course that's the last song of, of the film, The Dalmatian Plantation. And you've got Roly still complaining he's hungry. Oh and and with and with all the Dalmatians barking, all the lights all the lights in London there come on. And you've got the other dogs uh, joining in with the barking in the background. And there we go. That is the end of the film. Whew. Well, there we go. Uh, not bad for just over an hour. Look, I mean, I mean, considering the film is roughly the same length. Yeah. So yeah, not bad. So overall, <laughs> what did we think of the film? So Ellie, what did you think of it? Yes. Um. I absolutely love this film, but I do think it's, like, one of my favourite Disney films. Like, when people ask me, like, what my favourites are, it doesn't come up. But um, I think it's iconicity in terms of um, Corel de Ville and everything. Um, I think she's a brilliant villain. Um, and I just love the music that goes along with it, like you said. And, 
Yeah, but like it's it's not one of my favorites, but it's a brilliant film. But yeah. Yeah. yeah so. Um, yeah. So, so what? What did I think of the film? Uh, yeah, I th- I thought it was I thought it was thoroughly enjoyable throughout. Um, but what did? But what? But the big question is, what did the scores say? Well, <laughs> here we go. The story is definitely, an the story a very very strong nine. The only the only reason I st- it stops me from. Uh, the only reason I stopped it from giving it a ten is because of like some of the changes. I mean, I mean, yes, you do expect that sort of thing that you get uh, changes from uh, the source material to uh, uh, like from book to film. Uh, but uh, the fact that Roger was in the finance business in the book compared to doing songwriting in the film. I mean, mm. I, I I get I get what they were going f- I get what they were going for here, but I feel they could have at least somewhat tried to acknowledge uh, the source material a bit more as far as Roger's character is concerned. So, so that's yeah. that does that's the only thing that stops me from giving it. Um, that's the only thing that's stopping me from giving it a ten. Yeah, but the characters, on the other hand, that is a ten. No question. I honestly cannot fault how the characters <laughs> are portrayed throughout the film. Be it the dogs that help Pongo and Purdy, the puppies, uh, Pongo and Purdy themselves, Roger, Anita, Nanny, Jasper, Horace, and Crow. I mean, they they all they all fit, fitted their roles so yeah. well. It's like yeah, I, I the- genuinely cannot fault the yeah. I, cannot fault it uh the visuals uh on the other hand um it's no sugar coating it it's not it, it doesn't look as polished if that makes sense as some yeah. of the previous films like lady in the tramp and especially um the previous film they did sleeping beauty uh, yeah. i had to give it a seven uh it did look like the um now they did use the Xerox. They did use the Xerox process, which uh, eliminated the inking process, thus saving uh, time, uh, saving time and money. Um, so they managed to get a cheaper pro. They managed to get a cheaper process of animating, uh, animating the films. But um, but it, the animation does. You can actually, you can definitely tell that the animation looks uh, a lot cheaper compared to what the, um, compared to what the other, um, compared to what the other films uh, beforehand, um, I, was like, I mean, I was like, it, it does, like I said, it doesn't look as polished, but, yeah. uh, but for their, but I will say this, for the first, for their first film using the Xerox process, it's, um, they they did well with what they had, but, yeah. But uh, but I say I can't really see myself giving it any more than, uh, yeah, uh, than a seven. And let's just change the background quickly back to the Kingdom of Isolation. But oh oh my, uh, hang on a second. Ah, there we go. It's more like it. Right, yeah, there we go. Uh, right, so, uh, right, where was I? Visuals were a seven. Soundtrack, yes. Soundtrack, that's where I was at. Uh, the soundtrack is a seven as well. Because, um, again, it's, I mean, the soundtrack as a whole is great, but that's mainly, that's mainly on the music score side of things um but i mean but again when it i've done this before that when it comes to like um when it comes to talking about uh, like criticizing the soundtrack i was like you've you've got that one you've got that one song that's always going to stand out above the rest um and in, and in this case it's going to be in this case it's uh Cruella de Vil. but yeah 
but but like I but like I said earlier, the score does not get enough credit when it comes to talking about yeah. film soundtracks. But um, as like I said, as far as songs go, I mean, I mean, you do expect songs in a, a Disney film, but you only had like one proper song, and then like a very short one at the end of the film, and that that that's about it as far as the songs are concerned. Yeah. Uh, but the legacy this film has uh, i gave it i gave the legacy a nine now <clears throat> what stopped me from giving it a 10 is that when it comes to uh, when it comes to talking about the film as a whole the first thing people go to is corella deville they don't really acknowledge they don't really acknowledge the other characters yeah but I mean, I mean, I mean, yes, I get it. Cruella de Vil is an iconic character, but there is more than just one character in a film. Come on, guys. <laughs> Sorry, I'm one of those people. I'll give you a pass on that one. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but I say, there's, there's, there is definitely, there is people out there that are just like, uh they, they, they talk they talk about these they talk about these iconic characters without actually really delving into the um delving into the f uh delving into the film itself but um and my laptop being my laptop, it started, it start, it's decided, hmm, let's go slow and let's make this episode a little longer than it is necessary. <laughs> there we go. And as I say that, it is now here. Here we uh, go. So, let's see. The legacy this film has. Where do we begin? Um... On the initial release, it did receive critical acclaim from uh, from critics, and wow. <laughs> okay, um, that just happened. Uh, the score that the film got on Rotten Tomatoes, 98% on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, and an average viewer score of 8.1. Oh, wow. Um, it says, uh, with plenty of pooches and a memorable villain in Cruella de Vil, it's one of Disney's most enduring and entertaining animated films. And they're not wrong about that. So like, like I said, I enjoyed, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it throughout the, throughout watching it, um, throughout watching, watching it earlier. Uh, the, le uh, then you got in the American Film Institute's, um, 100 Heroes and Villains list. Cruella de Vil ranked at number 39. So, re so cracking the top 40 in that sort of list, that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. Uh, the the, re the other leg... Uh, what other legacy do... We, we also... We have got a massive... Le we actually... I think the reason why... I say the reason why the legacy score is so high for 101 Dalmatians, uh, the reason why it's a, it's a 9, it's like I said, I've... I've I've explained why it's um it's not a ten, but my goodness me, uh, it got a it got a director video sequel in two thousand and three with Hundred One Dalmatians to Patches London Adventure. I will cover the director video sequels eventually, but I've got to do the main animated films, the Pixar films, the live action remakes, and then I might go back and then I'll go back to the uh, director video ones. But uh, yeah, um, they've had two live action films. Uh, the first one released in 1996. The first live action remake. The, that, uh, the first live action remake that I've. Um, that, that, that Disney made. Which ended up getting a sequel 102 Dalmatians four years later. And later this year, we are going to get uh, a, a prequel spin off. On Disney Plus, called Cruella, focusing on Cruella Deville. Uh, in the world of television, wow, they had two TV series. They had off. They had a. 
they had a 101 Dalmatians series, and they also had one called 101 Dalmatian Street. But um, it was mentioned. Uh, it was mentioned in my last episode in, uh, when talking about Sleeping Beauty. Uh, we also had the Descendants trilogy. And if I get the character list up, um, because because I meant because we mentioned uh, that um, Mal is the daughter of uh, Maleficent, and there we go. Um, this uh, Cruella had a son in the Descendants universe, uh, Carlos, voice uh, portrayed by the late. Cameron Boyce. I mean, we still miss you every day, Cameron. But uh, yeah, so there's that. Uh, the Descendants trilogy. Uh, as if you guys haven't seen it yet, it is definitely one I would highly recommend that you watch at some point. Uh, I say Carlos features in the entirety of the uh, Dalmatian uh, descent. Carlos is in all three Descendants films. Uh, they even had a video. The Dalmatians even had a video game. Believe it or not, uh, 102 Dalmatians Puppies to the Rescue. I don't know how this game plays out, but uh, but that's not the only one. That's not the only game that they um. Ah, yeah. There we go. Video game based on the live-action uh, 102 Dalmatians, released on the Sega Dreamcast and the Sony PlayStation. Uh, you also had the Activity Center, released by Disney Interactive, and you also had uh, another um, PlayStation game, released only in North America, folks. Uh, a video game tie-in to uh, Patches London Adventure. Um, you also There was also... I was like, Disney were very busy as far as video games for, for this franchise is concerned. Uh, a print studio uh, game for 101 Dalmatians. There was also an animated storybook. I mean, uh, th there was a lot of animated storybooks um, back then. There was one for Toy Story. There was one for The Lion King, Pocahontas. And there's another one we can add to that list. Um, uh, but, oh! Turns out, turns out this animated storybook for 101 Dalmatians is for the live-action film rather than the animated film, interestingly. Hmm, interesting. How's about that? Uh, and there's also... And there was also, there's also another live-action game, uh, Escape from DeVille Manor. And... Uh, but interestingly, the character designs are based on the original animated film now that's in now that's the most that's probably the most interesting one of the lot the fact that you've got the animated versions of the characters from the live action film in this game i know that sounds like a lot to take in folks but <laughs> that is interesting so yeah um like i said legacy gets a nine the initial theatrical run had uh, $14 million on the $3 million budget in the USA and Canada. Uh, the total gross of the film was $303 million over the course of its... Um, over the course of uh, multiple re-releases afterwards. And taking subsequent re-releases and adjusting it for inflation, the lifetime gross of the film, $900 million at the box office. Now that's... Now that's... Let's just say that's... Mo that's Marvel ter That's like... Uh, that's early MCU territory as yeah. far as uh, box office earnings is concerned. Yeah. But still, adjusted for inflation, $900 million... Over its over its uh, multiple uh, releases, that's definitely that's definitely um, definitely not a bad achievement. <laughs> uh, 
And there we go. So that's the score. So that's the scores for all of those sections. And uh, I have done all. I did all the calculations already before the um, before we started recording. And we end up with a grand total of eighty four percent, which puts it in. Which puts it right smack bang in the middle of Lady in the Tramp and Alice in Wonderland. So, taking the Nightmare Before Christmas out of the equation, uh, 101 Dalmatians has managed to squeak itself into the top 10 at number 8 at the moment. So, 8th in, eighth in the list. That's not bad. That's not bad, no. I wouldn't have thought it would be that high. Yeah, I don't... I don't think I don't think I don't think a lot of us were. Oh, come on, work with me. And oh, uh, there we go. Put that there. Then close that up. And there we go. Ah, that's more like it. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yep. Yeah, that's more like it. Um, I'm, I might actually need to. I might actually need to make a separate tab on this spreadsheet for um, for my special episodes. I'm, I'm, I might need to do that at some point. But uh, but still, eighth place out. But still, that's not bad. Eighth place out of the seventeen films that I've covered so far. That's, that's not really... bad. Now, if I'm right in saying. Before we get to the Renaissance, because that's uh, and um, taking putting Nightmare Before Christmas into the equation, folks. I have done eighteen episodes of this series, nineteen if we include the one-year anniversary special that I put up earlier in the week. Um, and oh, I might actually get there. Al I might actually get there quicker than I would think. Because the start of the Renaissance, the Little Mermaid, that's film number twenty-eight in the animated film, in the animated films catalog. This was only number seventeen, so I only have another eleven films to go. So if I manage, if I somehow manage to get like one, possibly two a week, I could easily be at the Renaissance before the summer. <laughs> <laughs> and trust me, folks. Of all the periods in Disney's history that I am looking forward to covering the most, it's going to be the Renaissance. I do not want to leave anything unturned. I want to cover those to the best of my ability. Please, please be nice in the comments because I don't want to posse you with torches and pitchforks outside if, if they're just like, Why did you not rate this film higher than this one? I really do not want that to happen, folks. So please be nice in the comments. But yeah, there we go. Uh, that is it for this episode of The Kingdom of Isolation. The next film we're going to be covering uh, is going to be The Sword in the Stone. And I've got an... And I've got... And I have got an absolute barnstormer of a guest f uh, for this one. He's, um, let's just say, um, when we play football together, he's my striking partner, if you will. But uh, yeah, so I just need to get things sorted out with uh, with him as far as um, sorting out a date for getting that episode put together. But in the meantime, Ellie, thanks very much once again uh, for joining me. I am definitely looking forward to getting you back on board at some point in the future. I, think, I, I would love to actually have you on board for one of the Renaissance films. Which one, though? We'll work that out off camera, folks. <laughs> But in the meantime, hope you guys enjoyed this latest episode of The Kingdom of Isolation. If you did, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be dream chasers and Disney fans like the two of us, well, I mean, we're all Disney fans at this point, who isn't? If you want to be dream chasers like us, hit the subscribe button down at the bottom. Click the bell to join the Dream Chasers notification squad so you don't miss anything that I do on this channel. I also now have a Discord dedicated to all things Disney. Disney, Marvel, Pixar, Star Wars, Fox. And of course, that's all. That's where, from here on out, also where all the link, all the episodes for my Kingdom of Isolation in the future are going to be uh, posted so that nobody misses out. 
So, like, like I say, thanks again for joining me, Ellie. I'm looking forward to getting you back on board at some point. Um, so, yeah, next time we're going to be doing um, uh, Sword in the Stone. But that is it for us tonight. And uh, until I cover Sword in the Stone, we will see you guys next time in the Kingdom of Isolation.